Welcome back to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. I'm Thomas Miller. Today we're going to do something different. As Robert and I recorded the last episode that you heard about specifically the October 25th and November 8th eclipses upcoming, well, the conversation continued and I kept rolling. So I wanted you to just be able to listen in to some of that conversation. So this is really just an early in the morning coffee talk chat about some of the things upcoming in the chart, specifically Pluto moving from Capricorn into Aquarius and what that means, and then Neptune moving from Pisces, its home sign, into Aries. Truly, the world is changing. We all know that. And yes, astrology does give us some clues as to what that change might look like ahead of us. And as in the last episode, if you would like links to be able to download the charts that we are discussing, that's in the show notes. You know, as I'm looking at this and you're, you're telling us this, uh, the moon is at 16 degrees at the eclipse point. 16 degrees, zero minutes. Mm-hmm. And Uranus is at 16 degrees, 56 minutes. So just nary a, a degree away. Yes. And then the node, the north node, is at 13 degrees, so it's close. And then on the other side, over with the sun, Mercury is at 15 degrees, 52 minutes, just eight minutes away from that 16-degree sun. This is incredible how everything is so tightly stacked, and you're talking about money. And we know that Uranus in Taurus rules money. And that just before this eclipse, Saturn in retrograde and Uranus closed into that exact square by degree, not by degree and minute. But that would be the fourth time, including the three last year, that Saturn and Uranus have been in the exact degree square. Yes. And you know this the repetitiveness of that aspect, and and if you if people look at this November eighth eclipse chart, and I I love how you've set it for Greenwich, England, uh, Universal Time. So I'm a good uh, student. A good student. So the, the repetitiveness of this uh, Saturn Uranus conjunction is exactly the source of the world's sense of what on earth is happening this seems to be crazy spiraling out of control what what can we do to restore a sense of stability and 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 trust and permanency and things uh and that's more or less impossible under a square from saturn to uranus nonetheless if you look throughout history Things like wars uh, often mark epical turning points, which is where we are in the world. And we certainly are there in the United States because the United States literally is fighting for the survival of democracy or the rise of authoritarianism when it's being called fascism now in this country. So uh, this is not me. These are news reports. But if you look at the planets, Thomas, that you've just mentioned involved in this eclipse, Mercury, Mercury in the world rules every form of media and communications, every form of it, the internet. Now, the internet very specifically is ruled by Aquarius and Uranus because they rule things like the global brain and technology and computers and so on. But nonetheless, Mercury rules everything having to do with transportation, shipping, all of these things with commerce. Uh, The sun is the heart of the world. It's the light. So it's involved. Venus has to do once again with the entire banking and economic systems around the world. So any way you look at this, uh, the economies around the world are under a tremendous amount of stress. And if you go back historically and look at the effects of wars on the economy, there are people who make billions of dollars off of war. And that is part of this problem. And that's one of the reasons, Thomas, why I'm afraid that an eclipse like this will presage a a calamitous event simply to wake the world up to how deadly things have become and, and shock the world enough into having to face we must address this collectively. And I hope that that is the bright side that comes out of this eclipse. And I think it will be on some level. 
that doesn't mean I love astrology for this. People always say, well, does this aspect cancel out that aspect? No, none of them cancel each other out. They both happen. They're silos. So, yeah. 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 So that's uh, that's kind of a, the dark side, the shadow side of this eclipse that you mentioned. You know, let me ask you this. Eclipses. They have such a lore around them. <laughs> I'm following a couple of prominent financial astrologers, and they basically kind of live and die by eclipses. Eclipses are probably the biggest thing that happens in the chart to a financial astrologer. So they are all in on the reality of eclipses. But, for example, I mentioned that I went to the 2017 full solar eclipse in Wyoming. And I had made all these manifesting lists. I wasn't doing the astrology on the level that I am now, not at all. In fact, I was skiing in Aspen. <laughs> it was like <laughs> 2017. That was a very good year. <laughs> and so I was, I was into the manifesting, doing my subconscious mind mastery podcast, but fun astrology was still two years away. And I made all these lists of things that I wanted to manifest from the eclipse and things that I wanted to shift. And I went back and looked at the list about two years later, and it was like, yeah, you know. So it wasn't this big. It did The earth didn't shake for me personally, et cetera. So how is it that there is really this extra energy, and we're not just talking about a full moon and a new moon? Well, a, a couple of things. This eclipse is, first of all, eclipses have a, a ripple effect, a ramification effect, a continuing effect for, depending on what type of eclipse it is, three months to even six months or longer. And because this takes place in fixed signs, this is permanent. You can't go back from this. So that the world's economy is, in fact, changing because we are all so interconnected. And then you have competing political frameworks and political archetypes in communist China, for example, there's a certain uh, philosophy of government. In the United States, there's a philosophy of government. This one is under threat. So is the one in China, simply because of world events. And if you look on the world stage, that's basically what the competition is at this point. Authoritarianism for the world or democracy for the world or for just parts of it. And the, the illusion is that we can remain separate from other countries. We can't anymore. Uh, if you look at this chart, Thomas, the trines that I mentioned from Jupiter conjunct Neptune in Pisces, for example, that's great for the petroleum industry. Well, we're supposed to be moving away from fossil fuels, aren't we? So here we have a conflict. So arms is another area where uh, during war times, huge profits can be made. So there's a great deal of money to be made from wars, which is another incentive to develop weapons and to fight wars. But that those motifs and archetypes uh, are dying as well. It's... We're moving, uh, I think, away from uh, a global sense of, well, our nation is safe, that nation isn't, and our nation is separate from that. We're not anymore. That's uh, something of an illusion, as you can see from the shipping crisis, you know, that is a result of the Ukraine situation. So something that happens in Ukraine affects everybody, food shortages. So we're looking at things with this eclipse having to do with wars, the displacement of people, migration, the uh, food shortages, water shortages affecting people. These are enormous and collective issues that, that necessarily involve the whole world, and they will continue. And if something calamitous should happen uh, surrounding this eclipse within an orb of it, several months, let's say if something calamitous should happen, the point of it, even though it may be horrible, the point of it is to say, look, peoples of the world, this is not some isolated incidents. This is a precursor to what we will see more of if you don't learn to coexist with each other instead of trying to kill each other for property and money. Change your ways. Yeah. Well, astronomically or astrologically, but maybe astronomically, is the extra juice of an eclipse the fact that it's so close to the nodes of the moon? Well, yeah, an eclipse can only occur close to the nodes of the moon. 
they have to be near the, the nodes. So the, the nodes are always involved. And, and of course, the moon is always involved in an eclipse too. And you think, you think about the symbolism of the moon, which essentially represents security. It's the sign of the moon rules cancer, which is the natural fourth house sign in astrology, which rules the sense of home. It's very clannish. And we've got to rise above that. It's a, so it's the sign of basic security, cancer, the sign of home, family, food, and shelter, among other things. And every everybody is feeling under threat and uneasy because the sense of the world's basic security and basic needs for survival are being threatened. And people feel this subconsciously, if not consciously, all the time. So it's not so much that the eclipse does imparts extra energy. It simply says this is an important focus for you and your natal chart or for the world in a chart like this. That we're like, here is where the stresses are. And here are the types of events that are likely to produce those stresses and make you want to change. You know, I think we have said here, nobody changes until it hurts enough. The old classic is an Alcoholics Anonymous. You have to bottom out before you seek help. And that's something of the nature of these. And, and some eclipses have very positive aspects of the other planet. This one, unfortunately, does not. So it's not that there's extra energy so much as a, a gigantic focus on these space-time relationships, which is the actual, the signs of the zodiac do not have magic rays that extend to the, to the earth or anywhere else, because the signs of the zodiac are only apparent if you're on earth from any other planet, they wouldn't be there, they'd be completely different. So these are simply shorthand symbols for seasons of years, seasons of the year. In, it, in the fall, the sun and the earth are in a particular relationship. The vernal equinox, we're in a different relationship. So it's that space-time relationship between these archetypes that, this, that any eclipse emphasizes. And the north nodes, which you have to be, the sun and moon have to be near to have an eclipse, are associated with, of course, the moon, the moon's nodes. So all of these archetypes of basic security foods, families, shelter, and water, and so on, these basic needs archetypes, and the past, which is always associated with the moon and with cancer. That's where our ancestors are shown, is through the fourth house and through the sign of cancer, where we came from. So history is involved in this, and this, of course, is going to be one of these historic Eclipses, although with the state of the world now being so critical in so many departments, every eclipse for a while is going to be critical until the world decides which way it's going to go. Are we going to continue fighting each other and killing each other in this country, in America? Now we're seeing people being killed for their political beliefs. It's those kinds of things that are emphasized. I don't know that more energy is given, but certainly more focus is given to them. And then an opposition, the sun moon opposition in this case, Oppositions are not only stressful, but they're also a polarity, one planet or one symbol at the other end of the opposition. So you look to see what aspects other planets make to that opposition polarity. And here, the good one is Jupiter-Neptune, trine and sextile, the, op the opposition points in this eclipse. So there is hope. Absolutely. And Pisces is an international sign. Neptune is an international planet. So this idea that Jupiter of treaties and Neptune, both in Pisces and trine the Scorpio sun, sextile the Taurus moon, does give hope for a coming together. At the same time, Jupiter and Neptune are square Mars. So there is every likelihood of an expansion of wars. Wow. Yep. You know, Jupiter and Neptune there at home, both of them co-rulers of Pisces. I've been saying on the Fun Astrology podcast that the way through this is higher consciousness it for is. the planet. Good, Thomas. And it that's is. a wonderful symbolism to just cast your eyes down there and see those two co-rulers in just a subtle whisper almost saying exactly like you were saying, planet Earth, as you are looking at the path that you are going to take. And, the, you know, the, it's just like our intuition. It's always a still, small voice. And well, it's just unfortunately, almost... let Robert Glasscock drop the other shoe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hang on now. <laughs> Jupiter and Neptune and Pisces 
absolutely rule higher consciousness. They rule spirituality in particular as compared to religiosity, which are two different things. Amen. And if you see in this chart, as I do, that the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces is square, Mars and Gemini, and this is religious warfare. This is fascinating. Now, what I'm getting, because I was going down a, a higher path, spiritual, high consciousness is the answer, and you brought it back to uh, the challenge with the religious wars, basically. The coin always has two sides, right? And as we yes. look at the chart, there's always a shadow side and there's always a more positive side. And yet, I've heard this in the practicums and hearing it here, that you're reading this from the predominant shadow perspective. Why is that related especially to mundane astrology? We're not talking about individuals here. We're talking about the collective. Why does the shadow often prevail in what we call mundane astrology? Well, I don't know that it often prevails. I think it's the same thing I was mentioning earlier about aspects don't cancel each other out. They both happen at once. And one of the things you've pointed out here already about the spirituality, that happens to be growing uh, worldwide, not just in America. I've been amazed and very happily pleased over the resurgence of astrology over the last decade. Astrology, but huge. It, yeah. Yeah. And now it, it truly is. And so the trine that we have in this eclipse chart from the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces to the Scorpio eclipse, the Sun, the Moon, uh, the Sun, Mercury, and Venus in Scorpio, for example, into the Moon and, and Uranus and Taurus, there's a trine at sextile layer from a very specific point, and that is Jupiter and Neptune's conjunction in Pisces. And, and we are seeing, not just in this country, but worldwide, the emergence of uh, a spiritual movement, which is basically about people getting in touch with God or the all that is or the creator or whatever you like to name that massive reality that underlies all of creation. People are discovering ways to get in touch with that personally rather than having to rely on a secondhand middleman between them and God. That movement is very much alive and growing. It is growing. What is under... I guess we should say evolutionary attack, there's no better word for it, is religion, which is a different thing. Religions are stories about God, and they're all tribal, and they're all national. So that is happening at the same time that we have the trine to Scorpio so that people, individuals, as opposed to the collective, are realizing I can find God in myself and listen to that and test it to see if it works, if it's practical, if it elevates me and my understanding in my life, or if it doesn't. But they're tapping into that spirituality globally, which is higher thought. And I think that's the area where we have hope that more and more people are realizing, I have God in me. And you do. We all do. Every infant that is born has this connection, which we're all kind of trying to get back to, I think, in some form or another. And that's one of the things that religions promise you. If you will do this and come to this church or this temple or this organization and follow these dogmas and these rules, you will get to heaven. Well, it apparently doesn't work that way if you look at the history of religious wars around the world, you know. So we've got the Crusades sending off young, totally uneducated crusaders to fight a religion that they don't even know a Muslim. They have no idea. What, but they were told by the church to go kill these people, and they did. Uh, that's no longer going to happen because people know too much now. We know more collectively than we have ever known in history. And, and furthermore, we're all interconnected instantly through the electronic global brain, which is a human technological invention, a human technological evolution and development. We have a global brain for the first time in human history that's technological. And of course, people get frightened of robots and so on. But we are moving more and more into an integration with biological life and, and for lack of a better word, artificial intelligence. So it, it can be frightening. And maybe 
artificial intelligence will one day be the source of this overseeing concept of a, of a body. It's not that nations will go away, but I think they may become more like Disneyland. Over here, we have France land. Over here is Germany land. Down here is South America land. Over here is United States land. But they're still under the banner of Disneyland. So there will come a time where we have an organization in this global brain that oversees and it has to have some kind of authority and it this is a very difficult thing to do but that's the way we, that's the way we have to go humanity is now at 7 billion people we're getting near 8 billion we have to be able to um, eliminate control and contain tyrants with nuclear weapons for example we have to be able to eliminate and contain viruses and those are forever with us forever with us so these are fascinating developments in human evolution and i do think that humanity is is moving toward what you're talking about this higher consciousness and this personal connection with the all that is and that will translate into groups and larger groups and even organizations including political ones that incorporate that higher spirituality into their platforms if i were doing a fun astrology podcast I would look at that sextile to Pluto and Pluto sitting in those higher degrees of Capricorn, the old stodgy structures, sextiling those two sitting in Pisces saying, if you guys can get this, then the higher ground is the spirituality is the transformation. And what a cool picture that is, you know, sitting It's interesting there. that you bring up Pluto because if you notice... It is in the last degrees of its long transit through Capricorn, the sign of governments, of authorities, and so on. Pluto is about to enter Aquarius for something like 17 years. I forget right off the cuff. 17, it's full 14, 20. 20. No, it's a 20 full. It, goes, years. Thank it you. takes that's us right. to 20, 20. 2045, yeah. 2044. Yeah, yeah. 2044, that's right. It's So it's... It's about to enter Aquarius, which is a completely different sign than Capricorn. Capricorn is very much about national nationalism and national governments. And the world is evolving away from that. Pluto is going to enter Aquarius and stay there for 20 years. That's all of humanity, the sign of the humanitarian Aquarius, the collective. And the world governments are going to have to take that into account from now on. So in fact, what a local government in Moscow or in Washington, D.C. does is no longer disconnected from what uh, Kim Jong-il does in North Korea. So as Pluto go goes into Aquarius, we will witness over the next uh, 20 years, really, the redefinition of governments in the world. And I think this is part of what I was just saying is suddenly now the world, and it probably will be, as you know, when a, a planet ingresses into a new sign, especially an outer planet, because they move so slowly, so what they, they symbolize moves slowly. Um, these things change and become permanent. We're moving away from this nationalism. Even that's, I think, probably one of the reasons the cry for nationalism is so rabid now is because people sense this isn't working like it used to. I can't fall back on the old national precepts and nationalism that, that, that I used to because it doesn't work. We're all interconnected now. And that's the message of Pluto going into Aquarius is that all of, and as I started to say, when, when a major planet ingresses into a new sign, zero degrees of Aquarius, there is always a crisis. Now it can be a happy crisis or it can be a tragic crisis or it can be both. But there will be, a, the, during the period where Pluto is entering Aquarius and in the first degree, I would say, uh, and that lasts for a while because it can retrograde back, back through that path. That is the mark of an entirely new era, not only in United States history, but in world history. And that's what it's about, Aquarius. So no longer will it suffice to say, well, we're going to do this in the United States. There will be coming a body that will say, well, if you do that, here's how it's going to affect the entire world. So you need to go back and rethink this and refine this to take that into account, which will begin to happen more and more. So the collective ultimately is going to overtake local national 
governments in terms of precedence. Look at what's happening. I just mentioned earlier about water reserves in, in Lake Mead. So, and this is crucial to the entire Western United States in terms of agriculture and the lawns, watering your lawns and just getting drinking water. Uh, so all of those things, I think, emphasize this increasingly coming collective sense of responsibility. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, as you're talking, and I'm, look, I'm watching this, Neptune and Jupiter in retrograde in the higher degrees of Pisces, higher consciousness. And it's like this Pluto sextile is saying, hang on, folks, because higher consciousness is going to be the other side of the coin. And if we choose that, a lot of the paths that we're talking about could even be subverted. I mean, it's just a what a cool picture of the transformation from that old Capricorn to this new realm. I'll tell you what, if that's the outcome of all of this, I'm all in. <laughs> Well, you know, you look ahead, and, and I think Neptune goes into Aries for good in, in 2025. Neptune does. Again, it's historic uh, because Neptune moves so slowly. So it's very much a genera generational planet. 2025, then, is going to mark yet another epical turning point in this heightened sense of spiritual awareness over religious awareness yeah and the fact and it's a it's a huge thing thomas because when i know how to talk to god myself and i do uh, i'm not religious any longer uh, i was raised methodist but i've outgrown religions in the sense that once you learn to talk to god and this for the christians that are listening i will quote matthew 6 6 for example when you pray Pray not as the hypocrites do, loudly and in public, but go into your closet and shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in heaven in private, and he will reward you publicly. What religions do then is come between you and your direct experience of God. I have a revelation. I talk to God. He tells me or she tells I don't think of God in those terms, but it's easy to say that. If you have a direct connection with God personally, there's no need to go anywhere like a temple or a church or even to read anything or follow a secondhand dogma told you by some other man out there. Usually it's patriarchal. You have the direct experience of God all the time with you. And that's threatening to organized religions because you don't need them. Now, they certainly played a role. They have played a role historically, and they're very incredibly valuable in holding collectives together, clans together, tribes together. But it's no longer about the clans and the tribes anymore. Pluto is ruling, is moving into Aquarius out of Capricorn, which is, of course, opposite cancer of tribes and so on. So that's becoming less and less. And as people more and more realize, I can be in touch with God personally, and I can live my life in touch with that. There is no longer a need to participate in dogmatic rules set by a consortium of men saying, do this, do that, or you're going to hell. That sort of becomes childish on a certain level or immature, let's say. It's a, a kind of the fact is that we are born as expressions of the all that is. Every human being is that already. And the, the ideal is to be able to perceive that connection in yourself and with other people. And that's what's coming, I think, which pulls you away from uh, organized religion, in a sense, at, except it is organized or grouped in a higher level. Now I can talk with anybody who has this experience of God. It doesn't matter. And none of us have a particular religion because it seems so immature compared to the reality of living consciously with that connection with the all that is. And it's an incredible way to live. It's going to be fascinating to watch. You know, what's going to be more fascinating is to watch it with Robert Glasscock because <laughs> his astrological interpretation and awareness of all of these things that are going on is like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, it's just incredible. 
when you put his solar arc interpretations into the mix, it's like almost an unfair advantage. (laughs) So we will keep you posted on things. We're going to return back to our normal topical conversation in the next episode, but just wanted to step aside and extrude this so that you could see a bigger macro picture. We have a Discord channel where the conversation is continuing, also a couple of other podcasts, Facebook group, etc., so plenty of resources to stay in touch. Reading information with Robert, also all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. Mm -hmm.